Hi everyone, this is Frank Tamora, and today is March the 18th of 2013. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to play a video for you, and then I'm going to uh, point you to prophecy so that you'll understand what's happening, what's uh, so important about this news uh, report that uh, I was watching today. It has to do with prophecy, connecting the dots. So let me scroll down there, and as as we go down there, I just want to show you some of the, the prophecies that we're talking about. Obviously, we're talking about Israel in this video that's going to be coming up in a, uh, a few minutes. Because uh, Israel is going to play the major role in the last days. And Jesus is going to come back at the end of the seven-year tribulation. He's going to set up his kingdom in Israel, in Jerusalem, the contested area of the world right now. What is stopping the peace process right now? The land, the ownership of uh, East Jerusalem. Uh, all of these things have been uh, a cause of putting the peace process in a stalemate for the last two years. And so Israel is going to play a major role. And we know that because the Israelis are not going to give up East Jerusalem. They're not going to give up land uh, that they lost in the 19, or the, uh, the land that the uh, uh, attacking enemies th that lost in that war against Israel in 1967. Not, obviously, Israel is not going to give it back because they need it as a buffer zone for the next war. And they're not going to give it back. And not only that, but if you Google... Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is not going to give up East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is the eternal capital. They're never going to give it up. You'll see all kinds of statements by Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, that he's not going to give it up. So it has been a contention, another contention, of why the peace talks have stalled. And why the peace talks have stalled, we know there's going to be a war. And that war will uh, no, no doubt ensue because... They want to get back, the enemies of Israel want to get back East Jerusalem and all the land that they lost, and that's going to be the fulfillment of 83, Psalm 83. And then what's going to happen there, obviously, is when uh, the brothers of these inner circle nations around Israel see that their brothers were wiped out, <clears throat> the outer circle, uh, or the nations listed in Ezekiel chapter 38, are going to make a second attempt to try to take out Israel. So all of these nations who are mentioned either in the Psalm or in the Ezekiel, very, very important for us to keep watching. And so let me get into this, this uh, news report today. I will stop it uh, and, and put in <clears throat> a little bit of commentary in there, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, so that I can point you to why it's so important to what they're saying. So let's take a look. As the U.S. rushes to boost its missile defenses against a threatened North Korean nuclear attack, President Obama has been talking tough about Iran's nuclear program, using words like red line, saying all U.S. options are on the table. Now, let me just say, the red line, in case you don't know, is the line that they draw, speaking about either the United States or uh, Israel, they say the red line, when we reach that red line, Red line, we have to act. And what they mean by have to act, attack. All right? War, essentially. Well, this comes as he prepares to head off to the Middle East in the coming days. His first official visit as President of the United States to Israel. Joining us now is Israel's ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thanks very much for coming in. Good to be here. The President was uh, pretty precise in talking about Iran's nuclear program capability in an interview he gave Israel's Channel 2 that aired yesterday. I'll play the clip. We think that uh, it would take uh, over a year or so for uh, Iran to actually develop a nuclear weapon, but, um, but obviously we don't want to cut it too close. Is that your assessment, the Israeli government's assessment, that it would take a year between now and a year for, for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon? Now, before he answers that question, just let me just say this. Uh, for the past four and a half years, I've been warning that no one's going to do anything to stop Iran. And for the past four and a half years, no one has done anything. 
All they've been doing is putting these sanctions together, and no one has ever uh, set foot or sent a jet or tried to actually physically do anything to stop them. The sanctions haven't been working. They're not going to work. I told the people that they're not going to work uh, because Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, believes that he is a man that was born, destined uh, to bring out chaos that was going to cause war against Israel, and this chaos would bring out their 12th Imam, who was their, what they believe was their savior, and destroy Israel. And so he has no intention of ever stopping because he wants to eliminate Israel. As a matter of fact, Iran is in the Ezekiel War. So you, you'll see the ties here. Now Barack Obama said that he believes that they have a year. And so what you're actually seeing is the same thing as he said in the last four years, that we really, you know, we should give it more time, more time. Well, they've already given it over four years, and not one thing has been done, physically done, to stop the actual building. You could talk all you want, and you could stop it, uh, sending products, and you can do all these things that they're doing, which hasn't has any results. But until you physically do something to physically take those plants out, nothing is going to happen. And so. Israel knows that it's very, very critical. They don't have the time. They don't have the time that a Barack Obama thinks that they have. You're going to see a little bit more here. Well, we, we certainly appreciate uh, the reaffirmation of President Obama's commitment to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. We're, we're signed on to that program. Now, our intelligence analysts, together with American intelligence analysts, look at the Iranian nuclear program. We see many of the same things. We draw many of the same conclusions. But I'll just refer you back to something that Prime Minister Netanyahu said at the General Assembly uh, last September, where he said the main issue is not when Iran gets a nuclear weapon or even how long it Iran takes to get a nuclear weapon. The one question is, when can we no longer prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? Because the Iranian program is not only just building up on its nuclear stockpile, it's also moving underground, and there's going to be a point where we'll no longer be able to prevent them. And that, pro that point is not in the distant, distant future. That's not a year from now. Not in the distant future. So uh, when is it? Well, back in September, the Prime Minister said it would be sometime in the summer. This coming summer. Uh, and so you, is that the current Israeli intelligence assessment, that by this summer, that red line, if you will, where Iran has a capability to develop a nuclear bomb takes place? Not just the capability. It's when we can no longer see it. Uh, just last week, the Iranians announced that they're building 16 new nuclear sites. Uh, I guarantee you they're not going to be above ground. They're installing centrifuges. IR2 centrifuges that will triple the time uh, that they can put out enriched uranium. And so instead of being able to break out over the course of, say, two months, it could be reduced to a matter of weeks, and that will take place underground where nobody's going to be able to see it. All right, so if you can't see it, and they're talking about hitting them before that happens, and, of course, he mentioned this a year ago, there are, we're already into the 18th day of March. April, May, June, two and a half months from now, that if this is the scenario, we only have two and a half months before Israel has to move. They're going to have to do something because just like as the ambassador said, they go to underground and it would be that much difficult, almost impossible to stop them. So look for in the next two and a half months for the war, the rumors of war to be ratched up because something is going to have to be done. Israel's going to have to move and wipe out those plants. Now keep in mind, Israel warned Iraq about the same, same thing. Israel warned that if you don't stop building, Saddam was saying, if you don't stop building, these nuclear plants were going to take them out. They did it. In 2007, they did the same thing in Syria. They warned them. Bashar al-Assad, they didn't believe it. They took them out. Now, Israel's telling Iran the same thing, and it's gotten to the point now, you can't talk anymore, you can't wait anymore, you, you can't allow them to go underground so you can't see it anymore, you have to act now, and that's where we are. Is your government and the Obama administration on the same page in terms of intelligence assessment uh, uh, that this summer is, in effect, the so-called red line? Well, again, we look at the same set of information, we draw many of the same conclusions, but there are structural differences between them, between us. Um, what are the Israel, differences between Israel's assessment 
of, of when that red line takes place, which you say is this summer, and the U.S. assessment? It's not different of assessments. It's a difference of, say, clocks. I mean, Israel it has a small clock that's moving very fast. America has a bigger clock that's moving slower. Israel is a small country in Iran's backyard, threatened with national annihilation by the Iranian regime, and we have certain military capabilities. America, a big country far away from the Middle East, not threatened with destruction on a daily basis by the Iranians yet, and America has vastly bigger capabilities, so it can afford to wait longer. All right, so you hear him talking about, again, we hear this quite often in different videos, about Iran threatening to annihilate uh, Israel. And not only Iran, but the, the proxy nations from the Psalm 83 nations, of which Iran is very influential, are calling the same thing, destruction of Israel. And so they're, they're actually, um, they're not word for word, quoting the scripture about the uh, destruction or annihilation of Israel, but they're very, very close. They're saying almost the same exact thing as the Lord said, that this is what you were going to hear coming from Israel's enemies, and we're hearing it now. And it is the same people that Christ mentioned very, very specifically in the prophecies. Sorry, are you saying that if Iran doesn't back down and halt its nuclear program by this summer, Israel will take action? I'm saying Israel will reserve the right to defend itself, and that right... Now, let me just say this. If there wasn't any political... Uh, political watchdog in how you say things on the world stage the ambassador would have just came right out and said yes we are attack but because there's you know we have to play politics and you can't say certain things uh, to the world he's gonna come up with a different statement but essentially what he's what he in reality what he wanted to say but he can't say it that way is yes has been recognized by President Obama. President Obama said only Israel has the right and the duty to decide how best to defend its citizens. But a, lot of are US, a lot of U.S. analysts, excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Ambassador, don't believe Israel necessarily has, has the capability to deal effectively, do. destroy Iran's nuclear uh, program, if you will, that the United States needs to do that. Uh, Israel has the ability to defend itself. It has the right and the duty to defend itself. So, so you could do it by yourself? That option you're holding open if the U.S. doesn't do it? Our position, just like the America's position, is that all options should remain on the table, and those options are real. When all right, he said, do it by yourself. Uh, we know that Barack Obama is going to do anything. And one of the reasons why I'm saying that is, look what is going on in the world today. You have governments that are collapsing economically. They've poured in billions and billions of dollars to keep the war machines running. We saw that happen in Russia. They went bankrupt when they were in Afghanistan. And bin Laden said that's what he wanted to do to Russia. He wanted to keep them there to bankrupt them. You, you could defeat an enemy uh, without bullets, and that's what they were doing with Russia. They went into the economy. They were exhausting their resources, exhausting the economy, bankrupt them. And it wasn't for the fact that... Russia found oil some years later after that war, after they left Afghanistan and became this massive power again because of their black gold, this oil, uh, actually fulfilling prophecy that because Russia had to have been a strong nation again because they lead the war in Ezekiel 38 against Israel. But so we're, we, we're seeing the road being paved to Ezekiel chapter 38, Israel being alone. Uh, having to contend with their enemies. Zechariah 12 talks about Israel being alone in the last days, everybody coming against it. Everybody is uh, already, uh, we're seeing at the UN, coming against Israel. So Israel is alone. They're going to have to act on their own for their own sovereignty, their own security. Let me play it again. The president meets next week with the prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Will this be issue number one? It'll be one of the major issues we, we discuss across the table. Of course, there's a wide range of issues. The, the Middle East is in turmoil, uh, whether it be the situation in Sinai, uh, in Syria. Now, Sinai, the situation in Sinai. He won't go into it, but he just talks about the situation in Sinai. Egypt, is they're having, obviously, uh, riots over there. You'll see it in the news today that I'll, I'll put it up. I won't make a video about it. But they're, again, rioting because of the Muslim Brotherhood, the new government, 
And it is, uh, when you take a look at Isaiah chapter 19, uh, that first, uh, just start reading from verse 1 through 4, and you'll see that it says there that the Egyptians will uh, come against the Egyptians. And that's what's happening. We saw that last year. And it's still going on. It's still continuing. And so Egypt has got a lot of problems. And now uh, with Marcy, the Muslim Brotherhood, who's installing Sharia law and the his government has declared Israel the number one enemy that parliament has. And so uh, we have the enemies in the Sinai, Egyptians, uh, these radical people that are looking to destroy Israel. They're uh, moving closer and closer and causing more problems in the Sinai, and border in Israel. And of course, if you have Israel uh, mentioned that uh, in the uh, Psalm 83 war, that the Egyptians would be coming against them, then what's going on in Sinai becomes of great importance. Uh, attempts to reanimate the peace process, and yes, to address the advancing uh, Iranian nuclear program. Is the peace process all getting off the ground at all? Do you see anything happening on that front? Well, that's a question I think you'd have to pose to the Palestinians. Um, we, together the president with the will meet with the Palestinians. Now, for years, go back and just Google my Google my name and uh, BibleProphecyMan.com. I've been telling the people that the peace process is not going to go anywhere because the the issues of the land, give the land back, and the ownership of East Jerusalem. And if Zechariah 12.4 uh, tells us that in the last days, Jerusalem is going to be a burdensome stone. And in Scripture in Zechariah, that same chapter, it says all the people are going to be coming against it. Then you know that there's no way that Israel is going to give their land back or they're going to give East Jerusalem their holy city back. And what's going to happen is because they, the, the Palestinians want ownership, they want their land back, Israel won't give it back to them. They're not going to make those kind of concessions. They need the land to buffer that land that they took in 1967 in that war. They don't want to give it back because it's a buffer zone because they know they're going to get attacked again and they need it for a time to be able to respond to their enemies. So if they give that land away, they're not going to have that time to respond like they did in the past wars. They're not going to give it away. And so the Palestinians are going to, and the rest of the Arabs are going to resort to knowing that they can't get it by peaceful measures. They're going to attack, and then you can have the scenario of Psalm 83 war. Palestinian leadership in Ramallah. And I, I expect he'll pose that question to them. Um, we, together with the United States, share the same policy. That's We call for the resumption of direct talks without preconditions to discuss all the core issues, refugees, borders, Jerusalem security, to reach a solution based on two states for two Some peoples. Some of the things I was just uh, talking about. Palestinians are not there. For most of the last four years, they've refused to negotiate. We hope they'll come and rejoin us at the negotiating table. They blame Israel's continued expansion of settlement activity on the West Bank. Now, go, again, go back and just look what I've been warning you about, the construction in the Middle East. For years and years, I've been telling you, I don't care what you're going to hear on the news, the, Israel is not going to stop. They're building on their own land. They're going to continue to do it. And it's going to happen. In t all it is, it's festering. The Middle East is festering. And they're going to supposedly talk about these peace agreements to try to start it up again. But you cannot get it start when you know that the enemy that you're dealing with, that you're trying to get back land, just announces two days before you sit down that they're going to continue building on the land that they believe that it belongs to the Palestinian land. So nothing good is going to come of this. Well, in the past we ripped up settlements out of Gaza, um, 21 settlements, 9,000 residents, and to advance the peace process we didn't get peace, we got uh, rockets rained down on us, we froze settlement construction in the West Bank, you know, uh, for 10 months to get the Palestinians back to the table. Palestinians have a lot of preconditions. It's not just settlements. We have no preconditions. We have a lot of things that we have the Palestinians to do, but we don't fo we don't form them as as preconditions. We think the only way to resolve this conflict is through direct negotiations. One final question: uh, He's going to make a major speech, to the president. At All right. So then they go on to a different issue there, but so that 
there's a lot in this video that's really extremely important and points to prophecies, many different prophecies. And, uh, but we do know we're coming down to the end. There's no question about it. They're gonna, you know, the peace process is gonna explode. There's going to, obviously, uh, there's going to be war. A lot of people don't want to hear it, but this is what the Lord said was going to happen. And if you, you got to take the bad news with the good news. The good news is you don't have to be around for it. You don't have to be afraid of it because Christ has given us His peace. He promised that He was coming back for His church. He was going to take us away, and we know that that's what's going to happen and we know when it's going to happen when you shall see all these things uh, take place this is what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 24 when you shall see all these things that's the time that he says look up because your redemption draws nigh so that means start looking up because everything that the Lord has promised that we would see if we were watching that would be the sign that he was coming soon and what I tell the people now, and I'm going to close it with this, I get a lot, a lot of people asking me, it's probably one of the most uh, frequent asked questions, Frank, how much time do you think that we have? And this is what I'm saying to the people now. And I would say this to you, just stand up wherever you are, go over and put your hand on the doorknob, and turn the doorknob. Don't open it, but just turn the doorknob and stay there. Now, picture that hand being Jesus Christ, because that's where we are. His hand is on the door and about ready to open it up. And when he opens it, he's going to come for his church. And if you are part of his church, if you're part of uh, Christ, if you will receive Christ as your Savior, and if your name has been written in the book of life because you received Jesus as your Savior, if you understood that Christ came to rectify what we were lost through Adam and Eve and took away that sin, and it's not an error, it's sin, and we've been void of heaven without the acknowledgement of what Christ did, and nobody is going into heaven unless they acknowledge the Savior the dying on the cross for us to get rid of the sin so that we would have his covering and he could be our advocate. And the, that sin that he died for us when he took our sin away is for eternity. And unless you can have the covering of the Lamb, just like they put it on the post, the Jews, when that last plague came through and passed over the ones that had the Lamb's blood over the mantle, they were saved and we are saved in Jesus Christ. That blood better be on your mantle of your heart. It's not on the door. It's this time it's your heart. And Christ, when he sees that, will pass over destruction on your life because you would already have been sealed into eternity with Christ Jesus. So just keep the hand on the door because soon it's going to open. And I'm praying that my post would help lead you to walk in to the door when he knocks on your heart asking you this question do you believe that I am who I am and G and we know in the Old Testament Moses asked God who are you and God told Moses I am the same person that spoke to Moses is speaking to us today Christ God Almighty Emmanuel, God with us. And what a blessing that is to be fortunate enough to hear the call of the Holy Spirit to salvation to eternity. You have a choice now. Accept it or deny it. Pick the right world because it's for eternity. God help all those who refuse the message.